Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Grantmakers in Health Vice President for Program and Strategy, Osula Rushing. Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the second day of GIH's annual conference on health philanthropy, building a just and equitable future. There are 600 people registered for this year's conference, many of whom joined us yesterday for a robust set of virtual sessions, including opening remarks from GIH's new president and CEO, Kara James, a plenary session on justice, equity, and philanthropy's future, three breakout sessions on indigenous leadership, closing the equity gap in grant making, and supporting the emotional well-being of frontline workers a networking session on leading in times of distress and through a nationwide racial reckoning, and a closing plenary on federal opportunities to improve health and health care. Yesterday's plenary session slides will be posted here on the conference platform, and recordings of all of the plenary sessions will be posted on GIH's website the week of June 21st. Many thanks to all of you who used the chat box to ask questions, make comments, and share resources. Keep it up. Folks have also been using the hashtag GIHAC on social media. Keep that up too. And don't forget to watch the on-demand quick takes, which are our popular TED-style talks. While I have the microphone, which I'm sure some of you will soon regret giving me, let me say a word about today's agenda. We'll begin with a plenary session, which I'll introduce in a moment, and then head into breakout sessions, which will start at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. There will be two 15-minute breaks in our programming this afternoon, which we hope you'll spend taking care of you and yours, checking on your loved ones, getting some fresh air, taking a moment for meditation or exercise, and eating a healthy or, no judgment, not-so-healthy snack. We'll have two funder-only networking sessions at 3 o'clock Eastern time and our final plenary of the day at 345 Eastern on reprioritizing public health. Mona Hanna Atisha, Tony Eiten, and Laura Gerald on the future of public health. You definitely don't want to miss that. And now, I'm delighted to introduce our first plenary of the day, Centering Equity in Pandemic Response and Recovery. Support for this session was provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I'll turn things over to Kara to get us started. Thank you, Osula, and welcome back, everyone. We talked yesterday about the impact that the pandemic has had in spotlighting numerous disparities that we had throughout our society. And while we are still addressing the pandemic, signs of life returning to normal are beginning to happen. And many people are thinking about our recovery and what we want to see. And while we know that we can't return to normal because normal were the conditions that led to the disparities that we all became so um, crucially aware of in the past year. We want to think about what it means to take that time to build that just and equitable future so that we are addressing the issues that created the situation and making sure that we are better prepared for the next time. And I am thrilled to have with us um, in this conversation today, Dr. Marcella Nunes Smith who is the chair of the Presidential COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, senior advisor to the White House COVID-19 response team, associate dean of the Health Equity Research at Yale School of Medicine, and the director of Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Nunes Smith is board certified in internal medicine, having completed residency at Harvard University's Brigham and Women's Hospital and a fellowship at the Yale Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, where she also received a master's in health sciences. She's originally from the Virgin Islands and she graduated from Jefferson Medical College and the Swarthmore College. Dr. Nunes Smith, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. 
Absolutely. And for those of you who are watching, you can join the conversation if you want to chat your questions in and we'll weave those in as we go through. Um, I know we have a limited time with you, Dr. Nunez Smith, so we're thrilled that you were able to take time. And maybe you could just start with telling us a little bit about your journey and how you came to work for President Biden this year. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, and, and especially for that invitation to reflect a little bit. I know this has been um, uh, just a, a monumental and historic year for for so many, and quite frankly, a really difficult and challenging one um, for most. And so, certainly, you know, it is it is this context where I'll, I'll sort of start because there is just a lot about this year that is is quite frankly surreal. Um, but you know, uh, you know, as you as you mentioned, I'm a practicing internal medicine physician. I'm based here at Yale School of Medicine, where where I've been for over a decade. It's been uh, just a tremendous place to sort of launch a, a career, uh, beginning with the, the training from RWJF in the clinical scholars program, and sticking around for faculty, you know, after that, and uh, and building a health equity research program here, uh, and and really being able to pursue a lot of the, the passions I care a lot about, both in terms of research, but also mentoring and training and working with that next generation. And uh, so I was uh, surprised, but but uh, very willing and quite frankly grateful when then candidate Biden uh, and the team reached out and said, we want to hear and learn more about disparities in COVID-19 and what we're seeing, you know, and, and we're looking back at it in some ways it feels so long ago in other ways it feels like yesterday um quite frankly but you know we were we i talk about data a lot i'm sure we talk about it today but even then we were kind of struggling to to get data to understand who was getting infected uh, who was in the hospital and and who was dying and we have all come now to understand so deeply the grief gap in our country um and this is has its roots in what our intergenerational uh, realities, right? The the legacy, historic and contemporary, about uh, about choices that have been made in the policy space that that have led to the increased risk of exposure, you know, particularly in Black and Brown other communities uh, of color. But certainly, that that began uh, sort of ongoing communication and dialogue with the candidate and the campaign around just you know everyone already was so anchored uh, in equity and felt that urgency. Um, and continued you know, through the transition in, in, that, in that space. It's a deep uh, honor and privilege to be serving right now with the administration as a senior advisor, as you mentioned, as well as, as chairing this task force, which is bringing together just incredible, incredible voices from uh, within the US government, but, but also out really trying to elevate uh, voices that aren't always at the table, uh, perspectives that aren't always included, and to the point, you know, thinking about how we get equity in the response, uh, equity in the recovery going forward. But as so many of us in this equity space recognize, you know, equity is a team sport and we are all about equity in action, equity, the verb. And, you know, each one of us brings to this work our own personal experiences, our own personal perspectives. No different for me growing up in a U.S. territory where you know, the term kind of medically underserved was bantered around. And all I knew is that so many family members, including my own father, were suffering from preventable conditions, uh, becoming, you know, my own father had a first stroke when he was in his early 40s and was left paralyzed on his left. And just kind of hearing these policy terms in one, uh, one breath, but understanding the deep reality, how it touched my life, the lives of families and communities. And so we all bring that into this space. And it's just, I think, a unique moment for us to have an administration, a president and a vice president who set the tone from the top that we're going to center everything on equity. Right. So let's get into that a little bit. You have four titles, so uh, clearly a busy woman. Um, and, you know, talk to us a little bit about what is it that you've been tasked to do and what you are working on um, in this time? Yeah, so I, so absolutely, you know, the, Every, everybody, and I'm grateful to everyone who's joining in this conversation today because, you know, the we have been working hard. It has been all hands on deck. And I'm so grateful, really, for that uh, leadership that everybody is, has been demonstrating, that push, that advocacy, that, that commitment. You know, from, from, uh, from the work we said, so with the, the COVID-19 response team in the, in the White House, um, 
certainly. Oh my goodness, uh, uh, sprinting is is probably not even sufficient in terms of the pace and describing just the work that needs to 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 be done. But also, I think to take a moment and say how much work has been done by the group and the progress that has been made. You know, it, it's key. I think when we talk about COVID nineteen response, and I'm sure we'll talk more about vaccination today. And we need to. It's a key tool in our toolbox. But we have to keep our eye on everything. We have to think about equitable access to all the resources, whether that be PPE, you know, testing, therapies, of course, you know, vaccination, and then looking ahead for where we can uh, try to remedy and intervene and, and what, quite frankly, are, are, are beyond decades, centuries, and the embeddedness of the health inequities. And so, you know, just it's, it's great to be part of every kind of conversation that is revolving around some of these policies and practice. But I always say, because this is shared value, it is shared practice that, you know, I am certainly not the only one in the room with the equity lens. Everyone is bringing that equity lens. And it's just, I think, a, a clear indication of how important it is that we have infrastructure built that makes sure that we're pushing on equity every step of the way. And so that's very now work in terms of the response team. Um, and then with the task force, which, you know, again, is the, the result of an executive order President Biden signed his first full day in office. And that group, um, just tremendous, again, talk about people who are volunteering, working so hard tirelessly to be able to provide recommendations, the task force's advisory recommendations for you know, for the now, for the response, um, but also the future. You know, how do we make sure that the next time, even as we emerge uh, from the pandemic and the signs are hopeful, we are all so optimistic. Um, but yet we know, because you and I have talked about that we could predict, right, who was going to be the most affected here. I mean, everyone in this space, it is wonderful that there has been, I think, uh, a, a perhaps, uh, more more folks in, in, in that awareness now. But for those of us who have been in this space, we, we could predict who's going to get hurt the hardest, who's going to get harmed first, who's going to be first forgotten when resources are limited. And so we have to disrupt the predictability of that pattern. And that's a lot of that, that future work. So in those different spaces, working with the administration and, and just tremendous partners across all the agencies and quite frankly outside of US government too to think about equity in our response equity in our recovery so let's talk about that future work because we are here to talk about how we can build a just and equitable future and you started in your remarks and saying that you know you came to this work because there was a lack of data and documentation um, and we continue to have challenges when we look across all of our data sources and talking about disparities. There's sometimes where we don't have that ability to look at, you know, American Indians and Alaska Natives or to look separately at Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders or to even, you know, drill down at the heterogeneity within a population group. So could you talk to us a little bit about, and I know this is the focus of the task force, what are some of the things that you're seeing that people are doing to try and address that data gap so that we have better knowledge going forward? Oh my goodness, yes. And do we need to close those data gaps? I mean, that is high, high priority. You know, when the president signed the executive order about the task force, you know, he also signed an executive order saying, you know, charging an interagency group to think about equitable data moving forward because th there is a lot of work to do. And I know, you know, I know in, in this group of, of data friends, people will, will understand how fundamental it is, the foundational nature of equity, right? The violence we commit in data invisibility. Um, and I don't think that's hyperbolic. You know, when we talk, you so perfectly laid out some of the issues we have, even with the variables that, that, let's say we're attempting co to collect, you know, with race and ethnicity and how we need to disaggregate, how we need to really be able to drill down, how people get hidden in some of those roll up categories that you mentioned. But there are, uh, there are many variables that we don't collect, many groups that are, that are invisible. Um, and, and the choices in the data reflect our values every single time. So when we say, you know, we're unable, we can't really speak to the, the, what's happening with COVID-19 and, and people with disabilities, you know, what's going on with people who are incarcerated, those who are homeless, unsheltered, right? We, we don't really know. We can't really begin to think about intersectionality in the data. So when we think about 
folks who are, you know, gender or sexually diverse, we can't really see them in the data either, right? So we, the, and the list unfortunately is not a short one. And so, you know, I, I, I know sometimes people are just like, oh, not the data again, but it always will be the data again, because that is how we have to start the work. That's how we hold ourselves accountable in the work. Um, and so it's so critical. I really have to admit having gotten quite a crash course in data systems uh, through these various roles, understanding a little bit better, you know, what drives it? I mean, yes, we, we have uh, work to do around um, uh, educating uh, on why these data fields are critically important. But we also have work to do in the data systems themselves, the architecture. Uh, and so being able to, to use resources through data modernization to work at that local level. And this isn't just about public health departments, it's about our providers, our healthcare systems and others, that we come to consensus on the value, the import of having this information and broadening our understanding too, as we talk about contextual factors, as we think about social and structural drivers, and how do we make sure that our data systems are capturing that? But just one, one more thing I wanna say on this point is, you know, I find too often that we can use as an excuse the fact that we have data gaps and data lags in terms of pushing and advancing in equity, and that's just unacceptable. Um, and so, you know, even within the COVID-19 work, we've taken very intentional place-based approaches um, because of the truth of redlining and that history here, you know, place and so many other factors like race and poverty you know, they are so closely aligned and intertwined and being able to speak to metrics like social vulnerability to help guide the work critical. So we have to do both both things. We have to push on data, data completeness, data quality, um, making sure that everyone is visible and sees themselves in the data, their reality reflected, but we can't use data as an excuse. Yeah, no, I think I completely agree with you on the data excuse. I think the other thing that we sometimes use as an excuse is it's too burdensome to collect the data. We don't want to bother people with asking these questions. It makes people feel uncomfortable. And I think all of these are, are excuses to um, slow the work. So you, know, you mentioned we are still in a pandemic. We are seeing people who are many people have gotten vaccinated, but we know that we have a push we heard today the Kresge Foundation announced $2 million to help support vaccination outreach, as well as addressing those disparities. So from your perspective and where we are now as a country, what what's the work that's undone? And I think particularly, what's the work that's undone that you think foundations and other health funders can help to address? Just a great announcement from Kresge. And thank you, and thank you to everybody. I mean, this is just the key. And, and when I sort of referenced earlier, the critical partnerships outside USG. You know, here we're going to have a conversation uh, today with just the among the most critical of partners and thinking about philanthropy and what foundations and others can do in this space. And it's just so important, right? Not, not only for those resources, um, and those resources are key, but also just for the relationships that people are bringing. These aren't today relationships um, that funders and others have with communities have with the challenge of our day, which to me is all about how do we explain to our children and the next generations that inequities existed in the first place, right? And that if we let this moment pass and they persist, how can we look ourselves in the mirror? But absolutely, you know, back to the vaccination question. And, and of course, I mean, I, there are so many data caveats because of the data systems we're working with, but it doesn't, you know, this, this is a moment where we we know, I mean, we can know from our own experiences that there are many communities that are still not connected with vaccine and vaccination at the levels that we need. And even as we push for the 70%, which is an ambitious goal that the president has set necessary by 4th of July, you know, we see that um, many states have, have met that, that threshold already. As a country for people over 40, we've met that 70%. Uh, but of course, there's a story to be to be told there because it's uneven, right, in terms of vaccination uptake. And there's a lot of work to be done to reach out to to younger folks across kind of all demographic groups, and then certainly to make sure that the communities that have really carried this pandemic on their backs, right, are going to be able to benefit from the scientific discovery everybody else is. So, what keeps me up at night, 
you know, to be honest, is thinking about people who might be at yes or close to yes and have access barriers, right? Those structural barriers, that same reality we talked about before, the social structural determinants or drivers. And so, you know, making sure that we are systematic about removing each of those. And the president has really spoken to many, many of the ones that I hear about when we host state food around tables in the White House. You know, people say, I can't miss time off from work, right, to do this. You know, so what if I need recovery time? Who's going to pay for that? So to say, look, there's a federal tax credit for small, medium-sized businesses to be able to cover that, right? All, all employers in the country provide paid time off for your employees to get vaccinated and recover. What about transportation, right? For some of us, we just have that car parked in the garage or the driveway for other people that have to think about how they're going to get to and from a vaccination site. So importantly, having Uber and Lyft step up, great corporate partners there and donate rides between now and 4th of July. So key. But alas, 25% of folks in the country do not have a smartphone, right? And so how do we make sure that we, and, and you know, I just yesterday um, issued a charge to all the governors, mayors, everyone in, in the country to say make transit, public transit available, right? Make paratransit available. People with disabilities who, who have to consider accessibility when they are looking for a ride to and from vaccination. How do you think about childcare, right? And so stepping up and saying free childcare to get vaccinated and to recover if needed, but the biggest childcare providers in the country, but also funds for those local smaller ones. So thinking each and every one, but at the end of the day, you know, you've spoken to this. We have to meet people where they are. We have to make sure it's easy and convenient. We have to partner with trust, tr trusted venues as well, right? We need to par partner with trusted messengers in terms of countering the misinformation and disinformation that still exists. So all efforts for outreach, but to understand how closely paired they are. So whether we're talking about houses of worship, community-based organizations, you know, the new initiative, which is Shots at the Shop, so that we are with barbershops, stylists in the community to provide information, to provide vaccine access. But, you know, we're sort of like, bring all the ideas. This is creativity, innovation time. And so much of that is happening. This work is always hyper-local. So lifting up what's working well is a key, key goal for the federal administration too. Yeah. So, you know, these, those are all challenges. And I think, you know, as you said, that hyper-local and what are some of those barriers and rural communities where there may not be public transportation that we think about or other spaces where there isn't quite an Uber or Lyft in addition to not having the smartphone. And so how we reach and address those. Um, Fun, exactly. So and, and right now, and just to, to piggyback on that, to say, so that's exactly why, you know, the, the FEMA has, has begun to shift from those large community vaccination centers, which were key and were strategically placed, right, in areas that were highest risk and hardest hit. And, and you know, in the administration, we did use SBI to guide in the federal vaccination channels where we place vaccinations. But you know, FEMA and, and whether that was the community vaccination sites, those large sites, or thinking about uh, the pharmacy program, or you know, thinking about our partnership with the community health centers, and and those channels um, ha have been successful in reaching uh, people who identify as people of color. But but and yet, right? And so you know, FEMA is now shifting to have uh, the capability to support more pop-up mobile clinics. That's what we need. And we absolutely, I mean, thinking about our rural neighbors is key, just critical. And, you know, with the American Hospital Association announcing that partnership, so any employer that wants to host on-site vaccination, American Hospital Association will partner with them to do so. So you're right. I mean, we have to, to recognize that the strategies, we need, a, we need a full menu. We need the full toolbox because, the customization that is necessary to reach every community, every family, every person, you know, that's the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and I know we're still dealing with the pandemic and I don't want to underplay that because it is so important that we don't lose sight of that. But as we think about how we better prepare for whatever situation we have next, you know, thinking about our, our roadmap for an equitable recovery and even just being better prepared for the next pandemic crisis, whatever. What do you think are those biggest challenges we need to address to make sure that when the next thing strikes, we're not sitting here having the same conversation about the same people who've been disproportionately impacted by the whatever it is? 
exactly. I just don't want to use the, I just, I don't want to have to use the word disproportionate ever again, right? I mean, this is just the reality we know. We just, we feel it like that, that heavy fatigue, quite frankly, from it, because it is sort of like press repeat, repeat replay. And so, you know, the, I'll start with the task force, which takes this charge incredibly seriously. You know, I, I, I really like the way that you frame this, this roadmap, right? And um, Vice President Harris, which was still in the Senate, kind of gave us the blueprint for the task force um, because she was introducing legislation that would have created a, a, a task force focused on racial ethnic disparities. And so, you know, we have that blueprint from Vice President Harris with the charge to create this roadmap that you just referenced. So how do we make sure, again, that disruption for our future the disruption, quite frankly, you know, for now. And so it, the most proximal question, of course, is thinking about uh, COVID-19 and the resources and the equitable distribution of those resources. But, you know, we have to speak too about the fact that healthcare in our country, you know, the variability in quality, the variability in access, um, and that we have to work to address that. Um, but we also have to be thinking, and I'm sure you'll hear me say this even even again in our in our time together now, because we 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 can't sort of stop there. We have to think about all of the pathways to economic prosperity. We have to make sure that we are attaining educational equity. I mean, the, we have parallel challenges where we need to drill down on quality in all these different spaces, and most particularly, of course, in healthcare. Um, you know, when we talk about what drives the variance that we see in health outcomes, I don't know if everybody realizes that estimates are, you know, 60 to 80% of that variance is the result of the same social economic drivers that we've been talking about. You know, 10 to 20% with clinical care, I always say that's 10 10 to 20% that shouldn't be there, right? You know, how can we continue to have the zip code just so um, a predictive of, of all things, including the quality of healthcare that you might receive? So we have to work on that, but we have to attend, of course, to so much else that is often driven um, by poverty and limited access to resource and opportunity. We have to address that. We have to address that now. And the president and vice president are taking that lens across all the policies in the administration. Mm -hmm. And your center has talked and focused on, you know, a lot of these structural issues and barriers that are leading to the disparities. And you, you started with that, you know, we need to address those and going forward. And maybe for those who are not as familiar, because this is an audience that covers the broad array of all sorts of health and health care issues and um, may not be living in the in the equity space the way uh, you and I have and you continue to. So maybe you know, set the stage for people. What are some of those disparities that you think are the greatest and that if we could make progress on these, we would yes. really start yes. to see the gap close? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think uh, one of the, the other kind of themes as we go through is we see the importance, you know, in time of pandemic of something like stable housing, right? And for us to think about that, um, even now as, uh, we think about things like eviction moratoria and other policies, but at its root, understanding that housing stability is still a goal for too many, right? Access to, to good housing stock as well, um, ones that will support, not hinder your health, right? So critical. And so thinking about something like housing, you know, housing as a health issue and connecting those those dots uh, for everyone, you know, in in a public health crisis where we said I had the great privilege of serving for Governor Lamont here in, in Connecticut on his reopen advisory and chairing a committee focused on a community, but thinking about those who are at highest risk. And, you know, one of the things that we lifted, lifted up early on was that for many people, you know, if housing is crowded right, or multi-generational. And then we give a public health recommendation that says, uh, please stay home for two weeks, right? And separate yourself from others. What exactly, you know, are we saying? Not just the economic, because that's part of it too, but also just that ability, right? For, for folks who are 
who are not housing secure, what are we, what are we actually saying? Are we providing people with the tools to even adhere if they want to, to those public health recommendations? So thinking about that, you know, the need to have your own place to sleep, your own bathroom to use if you are trying to separate from others and keep others safe in your home if you've been exposed or have tested positive. So, you know, so I put housing down as one, right? Sort of one stake. And then, you know, we've talked already today about um, some other things like transportation and other things, but let's talk about food for, for a moment and nutrition, right? Really, because it's not just about calories, right? So we wanna make sure that people have nutrition access, nutrition security. Uh, and I don't think everyone recognizes just how many people in our country, how many children um, in our country face hunger, face real hunger, right? Not one missed meal. How many people are making choices between things like medication and paying rent and trying to buy food and oftentimes with a focus on calories and not even able to have that luxury of taking that next step to think about nutrition and nutritious food. And so investment, and, and the reality is this, the ROI is tremendous, right? Being able to invest in nutrition for everyone, in stable housing for everyone. You know, as we talk about ballooning health and healthcare costs, we have to approach it from this very holistic strategy. How do we address these social structural drivers, right? How do we understand as providers that this is part of our care provision, uh, is working with communities, but also working to address social structural drivers and determinants. Yeah. Now, I think those are critically important. We have a food access and security uh, funders group that comes together to talk exactly about some of these really important issues. And, you know, everything that you lifted up right there are things that are not quite in the health system space. And, you know, part of the conversation that we had yesterday and thinking about what we can do is this increased focus that we're looking to the health system to address a lot of these social issues and what the role is. And so I think, you know, speaking to the funders in this group who may be sort of thinking about whether or not they are traditionally in the healthcare space and what space, what role they could play in addressing some of these issues. I guess, where do you see that line and how do you see people helping to move that conversation a little bit broader given, as you said, that 80-20 rule where only about 10 to 20% of health outcomes are the result of clinical care. So how might you sort of encourage po folks to think a little bit beyond that and what they can do to help? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, there, there is so much that, that can be done. And so, you know, and I, I have the, um, the, the privilege too of being um, a, on the board of our community foundation for Greater New Haven. And so certainly a conversation I know is having is happening and, and being had across uh, uh, boardrooms and others in, in the philanthropy space. You know, what we haven't talked about so far, I think is just the vulnerability of the nonprofits who do step in to address and meet those basic needs. Um, and so that's often, you know, in the healthcare space, and we do see a lot of innovation um, there. I mean, there are some health systems that have gotten together and have literally built housing, right? And said it is more affordable, high ROI, if we as a health system invest in housing um, for our patients. And so, you know, I, I, I want to continue to encourage all the health systems that are thinking creatively um, about how to recognize and respond to um, what are these social inequities and social vulnerabilities. But also, you know, one of the great mechanisms is to partner with the experts, right, in that space. And those often are, are nonprofits, many of them small in our various communities, who are the ones that we can sometimes be very eager to refer to. I mean, you know, we might say our first step is that screen for with our patients for social structural determinants, and we'll refer out. And then I think we, we have to follow that, right? The same way we might follow to a subspecialist referral, we have to follow that pathway. Because if we refer to agencies that are just already struggling, um, and don't have the capacity to be responsive, you know, what are we doing? So I think one of the just, you know, th things I would continue to encourage that conversation around is how can philanthropy and funding work to shore up and sustain and help with that nonprofit sector, uh, where there is also a lot of creativity and innovation um, to be had and to be found, but that are just key partners um, in the space, particularly around addressing social structural determinants. I mean, I am just staggered by some of the statistics about nonprofits that might uh, shudder 
right, because of the pandemic. And our ecosystem cannot, I mean, really just, just cannot. And so it is a very distressing irony that at a moment when we're having conversations and discourse about the importance of those fundamentals, that we might actually see the agency's most expert, most successful, most trusted um, need to close their doors. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's the capacity question is one that continues to come up and how do we help support capacity? Uh, yesterday when we had our conversation thinking about the role of philanthropy's future and getting out and partnering and the question of how do you identify some of those and um, one of our speakers encouraged us to get out of our offices and go meet the communities and get out and, and find those leaders in that space. And I guess, you know, from your perspective, any other advice on how to identify who those leaders are in the community who are working on these issues? Because there isn't necessarily, I mean, there are some, there are some, I, I will say, resources that you can use, um, but there isn't necessarily a a Google community group, you know, list that just is pops up right away. So how do you find some of those leaders? Yeah, and this is so important. And I do think, I mean, I completely agree just um, for kind of everyone in this space that, that you know, it is a priority to be um, uh, not not just outreach, which is important, but, but that engagement, that true partnership with community and community leaders, which you know, will push us to have really hard conversations about sharing our power and sharing our privilege. And, you know, we, we have to do that. And so even kind of, you know, for, for, um, for us in the community foundation space, it's a lot about thinking about, how, you know, the how to, how are we going to award and make grants and, and being able to say, we're going to, uh, you know, in, invite to this, to this table that was set without all the people there that should have been and say, well, hand the table over to you, right? You're going to, um, be in charge of these grant making decisions because you are the experts, right? And communities are always the experts. I think this is so important. Can I say enough? Communities are always the experts in what's needed. Uh, and I think it's important for us all to take a moment and pause and, and be able to name our own, like what is the expertise we think we're bringing to, to space, but to not think that that's the most important expertise, that that is a substitute for what is the situational intergenerational knowledge that communities will bring. And so that's absolutely right. How do you tap into those community resources? And of course, you know, how do you make sure that when you show up, you're showing up in a way that is respectful, um, that is humble, that you're in a learning posture. Um, and so that people will want to build trust with you, will want to partner in the work with you. You know, I mean, for me, the the answer is uh, is is always um, about asking, right? And so to think that you're going right, I mean, this isn't something that is an internet search. You have to be in real conversation with people. And so, if on the provider side, it's being in real conversation with your patients. You know, for funders, it's about being in real conversation with grantees. But kind of trying to to say this is our this is our path forward. We're trying to deepen our relationship. We're trying to uh, to reckon with and, and understand the ways in which we do have to power and privilege share. And we're trying to think about who to invite for that first conversation. And then you ask them, who do we invite for the second conversation and do that? But I saw, but, you know, just, just start, you know, I, I find some, some, uh, some folks are sort of just like wait, waiting for, you know, a, a proverbial checklist or something. And I said, as long if you're, if you are, um, if you are guided by that North Star of advancing equity and getting to equity, you know, you, you lead with that, you name that, you name why we don't have equity today. You talk about those systems and structures. We talk about bias, discrimination, and racism. You name it to people and you say, we own some of that, right? And then how can we work together to move forward? But it is so important. That is, it's, it's, it's first, it's almost the first principle really is that this work should not, not be done in isolation. Mm -hmm. And as we um, begin to kind of close out, I wanted to come back to something where you started with, you know, the grief that we've felt this year, that we've all had, the challenges that particularly, you know, communities of color and others have felt in, in the burden and the disproportionate impact and the stress that that brings. And as we think about an equitable recovery, we know that before the pandemic, where we had, you know, less than half 
of people of color in particular who would qualify for serious mental illness or any mental illness not getting access and treatment and services from a mental health perspective. So we know we've talked about our children and the needs that they have, behavioral health and mental health needs of the year, but it just, again, not returning to normal because normal was the disparities that we saw. So where and how are you thinking about mental health and how we figure out the plug those gaps to minimize both impact and also reduce those disparities in, in these areas. I'm just so grateful for you to, to raise that. Um, and, and right, and to, to clarify that our destination is a, is a new normal, right? And that we absolutely have to be building back better. I mean, I don't wanna go back to what we had before either. So, you know, and, and behavioral health, um, that umbrella, it's the silent tsunami, right? That's that's our that's our next pandemic, and we have to grapple with it. We have to understand it. We have to put the resources that are there. I mean, we have to face some of these realities. We we've, we've kind of created a system that has separated behavioral health from everything else, and that has driven a lot of stigma, um, but also a lot of tiered resource access. And so even as we think about funding, um, and we don't have funding parity in that space, you know, we need to talk about things like, especially here, linguistic and cultural responsiveness, and what that looks like as well. You know, you know, across all the things we're talking about, you know, we haven't yet talked about it, but it's so important just the representation um, uh, in in the various spaces and leadership spaces and workforce spaces. And that is just key. You know, the task force, um, uh, as we were, were speaking about earlier, um, has already dedicated a, a one of the, the public facing meetings to behavioral health. And, uh, and the task force has put forward interim recommendations speaking to this specifically, lifting it up as one of the short list of things that we have to prioritize um, in order to get us to that new normal. And so, you know, this conversation, both in terms of, of policy and where those policy levers are, but also this kind of whole of society conversation that we need to have um, that is about stigma reduction, that is about connecting people easily. Again, you know, so many lessons we can take, I think, from our approach to vaccination and a vaccination campaign, you know, ease and convenience, addressing structural barriers and considerations, all of that have to carry over to other spaces, including when it comes to behavioral health, as we have conversations about mental health, wellness, well-being, substance use disorder and other things. So, so important. And 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 for, for the youngest among us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. We barely scratched the surface on a lot of issues and could, I mean, go in so many directions as we think about both what we have learned in this time and also what we need to do to make sure that we're better prepared for the next time and that we um, are also achieving health equity for everyone involved. And we know that your time here in, in DC, at least for this particular focus, is, is time limited. So, um, and as you think about your return or, or your new normal after um, sort of life in, in DC, what are you hoping you'll have, be able to say changed as a result of the work that you're doing? Yeah, no, thank you. You know, it is, um, you know, one of the things I say, I'm trying to work myself out of a job, right? And then all of us in the health equity space, that's what motivates us, right? Because I really want my children to be like, what does that mean that you were like a health equity? What is that? Right? What, why was that even needed? What is this? And so, you know, continuing to just work ourselves out of necessity um, because, you know, be, right now equity is not the default, right? Um, and to achieve equity, it takes every intentionality and then some. And so, you know, imagining a, a future state, hopefully not too distant, where equity is, is default, right? Where that is the beginning, the middle, the end, where that is built into every accountability system. Um, and that's so important, right? Because even as we talk about this, we have to move from a lofty ideal, right, of sort of equity to drill down to sort of how are we gonna hold ourselves accountable in this space. Um, and 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 so it's it's always you know collective. I kind of returned to where I, where I began. Um, we are uh, hopefully, you know, um, moving to and through the pandemic and trying to get to the other side. We certainly have work to do here domestically. I mean, there is a lot of progress that has been made. Yes, full stop, we have more work to do as well. You know, this is a global pandemic. 
we have to think about um, our roles and responsibilities there as the president is doing and saying, you know, we 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 have to uh, lead on the global front as well to help um, our neighbors a- across the world to get to and through the pandemic. But, you know, yes, as as you know, looking ahead and, and returning to kind of full time life uh, at Yale, you know, I, I am really hopeful that both the work that is is happening in the response team across the whole of government, as well as those recommendations from the task force, you know, are just kind of additional pieces that are part of moving us forward so that we get to that roadmap that you talked about, you know, so that it isn't kind of let's learn these lessons again the hard way, um, but that there is in place really, really just in a proactive way, a preemptive way, the systems, the structures, the policies, the practices that will ensure equity across, yes, the COVID-19 and the health resources, but those broader resources so that we begin to address these questions of income inequality so that we are investing in our future generations so that it doesn't have to be kind of this expectation that certain groups and certain communities cannot build and benefit from wealth in our country, right? So all of that. So so the work that you know I'm part of now, a tremendous honor and, and just pieces and parts, um, but we have to take the whole of government, whole of society approach. That's how we get to and through and to our better normal. Thank you. And in yeah. the very last seconds here, we have a number of funding partners. We talked about Kresge's announcement. There have been a number of our funding partners engaged in COVID work throughout the year, um, collaborating in communities and working in partnerships, some of whom are actually well connected to you and others who may not be. So how might you know health funders who are interested in working with either you or state government, kind of what are your suggestions for best ways to get engaged? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again. This is an opportunity because I cannot express uh, deeply enough, quite frankly, the gratitude. I think we would all say that the work, it is through partnership and collaboration. Uh, and we encourage people to continue to lean in as you have been um, and to have those funding priorities really reflect the values um, that we've been talking about today. And so, you know, of course, whether it's in this vaccination space where we all hands on deck, again, to make sure people get connected with the information they need, with the access that they need to get vaccinated. You know, also that longer term investment, those pathways to economic opportunity, to educational opportunity, so critical. And then also these multi-sectoral partnerships, right? And how do we, these coalitions, I think that's a story that just hasn't been told fully yet. Um, You know, it's amazing all the kind of silos and barriers that have been broken down um, and how those collaborations across different sectors and industries have come together to really push and get us to where we are and I think are gonna be key ingredients for success moving forward. So absolutely, you know, for for us and the in the White House team, you know, our doors are most certainly open. We are eager to work with everyone um, and and to hear all ideas and to be part of those conversations. But but I do I do think that equity work is hyper local, right? And so being able to say, look, where are we? How are we going to help um, support and push? those local initiatives, what's happening at the states, you know, tribes, territorial, local jurisdiction levels. Um, And, you know, I I think the mistake we often can make is waiting for the call. And so just really encourage everybody to say, you know, pick up the phone and call, call that public health department, you know, give a ring. We are here too to say, listen, we want to get involved more. We want to be in line. How can we be helpful and bring our resources to bear so that we can meet this moment? Um, And that is, that is our collective work. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith. We really appreciate, first of all, all that you are doing um, and your family sacrifice of you in this moment to help us for the greater good. Wish you all the best of luck. And um, again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. So, um, happy to do it. Again, um, as Osula mentioned, we have a little bit of a break. We encourage you to stand up, stretch, grab a snack, um, check on your loved ones and join us back for our breakout sessions at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, We have three, the impact of the pandemic on children, learning from COVID-19, catalyzing public health system transformation and public trust in the COVID-19 vaccine. 
followed by our networking sessions, and then we hope you will join us in the afternoon at 345 for our final plenary of the day, reprioritizing public health. Thank you, and we'll see you soon.